Um, maybe, we, maybe we just start this one by chatting and then, because we'll have an intro yeah. anyway, so please, yeah. please go for it. <laughs> So I had this guest on and he introduced me to this concept that I was unfamiliar with called the Hamish line. And it was a, it was a New York Times piece that a gentleman named David Brooks talked about. And Hamish is a Yiddish word for, for a sort of sense of warm and domesticity conviviality. And he had talked about his travels. He had been traveling and, and, in some he stayed, it was a safari, and in some spaces he stayed in camps where the Maasai and the people that were leading the safari would play games with them and do these little mock hunts with them, and they would kind of have these adventures and relationship buildings with other people that were on the safari, and at other times there were these more luxurious accommodations where everybody was eating dinner separately and everybody had their own little camps and space. And he talked about this idea of the Hamish line of being this threshold where when we seek more individuality or more sort of upscale elegance, we often lose that deep interconnectedness and that those relationships that we build, whether it's in the grocery store line, as you and I were just talking about, or if it's at the table next to you at more of a diner, a greasy spoon type joint where you can feel that warmth and conversation flowing, or when we seek out experiences that aren't about the where, but are about the who, we're staying south of the Hamish line. And that those are, that is the meat of life is those interactions. And I think that by nature, and I've learned a lot about this in the past year, I think as humans, we're herd animals, we are meant to be together telling stories and having yeah. conversation and using one another as, as sounding boards and to, and to regulate from a nervous system perspective. And yeah, so I think it makes me think of uh, traveling and all the random conversations that just at the start of the day, you never would have, you, I don't know you had a, an itinerary or a plan for the day and, and it didn't include that random person that you met there or that person that you met there or that person you met there. And, and actually, you know, when, when I, when I think back on some of my travels, you know, the moments that stand out were the, were those, were those conversations yes. um, as opposed to, you know, the visiting the, the iconic <laughs> statue yeah. or, or whatever. I'm like, yeah, cool. That was a statue. But this, the way that this person, you know, made me feel for those 20 minutes, the way that I was so appreciative of the time that they gave me to direct me to the real place to go or, you know, or, or to check in on me and, I, and, and talking to friends, you know, countless stories where, you know, um, uh, people have just been in situations where they weren't situations they wanted to be in, not, not dangerous ones. And it was just the, the kindness of a stranger that 20 mm -hmm. years later has, is, is the thing that, that sticks with them. And, um, you know, I, I think traveling is one of those things that's, um, God, what would be the phrase but you know they're quite anxious things when particularly if you're getting on a big trip and you have no idea what's going to happen but you, you kind of I guess you start to regulate more and more the longer you're on you're on a trip or you're on a travel and uh you know you, you then start to become more open you know you find yourself six months into the trip just talking to random people all over the place because that's yeah. what that experience kind of um, requires um, but it's it, it takes to, I guess it's just building capacity you're just building your own capacity you know you talk to one person on day one you speak to two people day two three people day three you know before you know it you know you, you've just found the rhythm but to begin with that the concept of talking to 50 new people a day in mm -hmm. Cairo <laughs> you know in Egypt was just never going to happen and you know. They've shown, they've shown, and I wish I had uh, the data in front of me, but they've shown that travel increases our neuroplasticity. And it is that being in a novel environment and having to navigate it. But I think that you brought up a really great point, which is it's also having novel interactions that I think are cup filling at times challenging, especially for those of us that are more introverted or more shy. But those are the basis of the memories that we form when we have experiences. They're built around relationship, not around seeing the sights, not around. And I think that this is true. This is true for everyday life, too, that those memories that have a certain gravity to them where we can feel pulled back into them are those ones where, you know, we 
suddenly found ourselves around a dinner table that a dinner that had gone on longer than we expected because the conversation just kept flowing and yeah. and the laughter kept flowing and and those are those spaces that i think hold some weight some gravity in our memory banks because they are it's what we were meant to do as humans is is to share amongst one another yeah and the way that the way that other you can the way that other people can uh, uh influence the way that you feel like you remember people that make you feel good right that that make you yes. you know uh, james my my partner is talks about you know um being seen and be and being heard and i, I would add another one is is the way that you that you're made to feel you know everyone's had that experience walking into a store and feeling judged <laughs> you, yeah. you know, by, by the oh, store yeah. by the store clerk or the, the store assistant and and how that immediately you know puts you on edge about wanting to even be in there or or, or, or in a restaurant or or anywhere else a group of friends absolutely being to a group of friends you know um and then there's they have that, that experience of being used to a group of friends and that one person that took the time to you know to ask them questions and, and inquire about them and just be a, a good human being not a good human being that's the wrong phrase but just be a, a human being you know that that was that was inquisitive and you know, wanted to, wanted to know more about them and yeah yeah so, creating a container for reciprocity is is kind of how I tend to think about that especially and I'm sure you obviously I mean just the way that we initially interacted never having spoken before I can tell that you already that you create a really beautiful container for seeing people and I think as an interviewer that is one of the most important things is how how can I make people feel seen pretty quickly especially when you're dropping in cold into these yeah. conversations so as a as a day job as a filmmaker one of the things I have to do is is we'll make a film about someone and then we need to get a voiceover and um, to go on top of that film. And so from a client perspective, the client wants to know, like, I need to know what the questions you're going to ask them because we need to know what the, you know, what answers we're going get to back, get back so then we can we can create the voiceover. And <laughs> at times trying to have the conversation with the client saying, you just need to let me go and have a 10 minute conversation as if we're having a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and we're hanging out at a coffee shop and, and trust that they will then open up and give you so much more than if I go in with 10 questions where they'll just yes. give you the stock answers that, they give into a thousand different interviews before. And uh, what I found we have to do is have those questions <laughs> to appease the client, which which is equally important because that's also respecting them in the relationship, making them feel safe. And then say, yes. okay, well, I'll ask these 10 questions, but just FYI, this is going to be a 20 minute conversation because I'm also going to ask these questions, but I'm just going to kind of go off on tangents and, and have a conversation with them and, um, you know, talk about what 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 I had for dinner last night, and so on and so forth. Because it's that's the moments that 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 allow people to relax into a conversation. As opposed, what, to, I need to know this about you. Tell me this. We're making a film. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful practice, too. And I think that this is something that I think. I came into interviewing with interviewing is interesting because you can't really go in a corner and practice it by yourself. And I'm right. definitely the kid that liked to go in the corner and practice things by myself and then come out when I had some sort of mastery of a skill yeah. and interviewing, you just have to, you just have to do it and you just have to fumble when you're fumbling. But one of the things that I've thought a lot about is how I can both create a space where somebody can feel comfortable and grounded and dropped in so that they feel safe to share their story. But it's also how you stay present to a conversation that when you yeah. come in with that pre-prescribed list of questions, not only is somebody going to give the spiel that we all have about our work, that's that kind of elevator pitch that we repeat ad nauseum, uh, but so how I can create a space for them to have something different to say, but also how I can be present to what is there in that day and the words that they're saying and follow those threads instead of my own preconceived notion of what a conversation might be. And I've carried that with me outside of the podcast too, into how I interact in daily life, that that is a part of seeing people for where they are right now in that moment is following those threads and, and trying to listen both for what is said and what is unsaid yeah. in a way that allows somebody to be seen. I found, uh, I found that um, one of the things that's help, been helpful for me in, in building relationships with people is to find um, a common ground between us, like a common experience and say, Oh, I, I've had a similar experience to that. This is what happened in my experience. And to, and to share that and, 
and then you know you've got this 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 foundation place to to kind of converse on oh this is what happened here and this is what happened there and did this happen to you or whilst this happened to me and it it naturally starts to flow a conversation um because you're mm. you, you know you're, you're sharing something um well obviously you're sharing a, a, an experience and um it's not that i wouldn't i obviously i don't go into relationship trying to manipulate it but I found that's really helpful if I need to build a relationship very quickly. And, and, and again, as a photographer and a filmmaker, you know, I am in situations where I need to build relationships very quickly. Yeah. And, and having a couple of those markers, like, and being genuine with it. How's your day? How are you? What, what's yes. going on? You know, just a, a pleasant introduction. And then, and then a, as the conversation develops, I've had that experience or I've had a similar experience. It's like, you, it, it's, it's rapid fire or, you know, like a rapid fire relationship building, but mm -hmm. it's, it, it and it has a purpose in that context, of course, but it, it just, you know, I guess you're just signaling to that person, you know, hey, we're not too dissimilar and, you know, we can have this conversation and and, and, and be safe with each other or, 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 you know, this is not going to be awkward or or weird. It's like, let's just, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think this is an increasingly important skill too, because I think this bridges across divides when we find something that is shared between us. We are yeah. able to bridge all kinds of, of of different divides that we experience in life and, and drop into one another and get to witness one another. Have you found, um, so obviously with having this con uh, this conversation in the context of the nervous system, so maybe I'll just do a quick, uh, a quick introduction. Kate, thank you for coming to the podcast. <laughs> Chris, it's a pleasure to be here already. Um, so, and um, so this is part three in the in the mini series of of conversations that we're having about the the nervous system. So, uh, for the context of anyone that hasn't listened to the other two episodes, um, over the past eighteen months, I've been doing some nervous system work and and being led by a practitioner called Irene Lyon. We did episode one with Irene. That was like a one hundred and one um, on the nervous system. Um, you know everything you need to know in a in a podcast, so to speak. Um, and then we did a second episode with a practitioner that I've been working with for several years, uh, a body practitioner, actually. I'd been to him with various injuries and what <laughs> it took me years to even realize this, is what he was doing for me. He was helping me to increase my sensitivity to the way that my body felt. So instead of just saying, hey, I've got a torn hamstring, <laughs> please, can you massage it and, and make it feel better? He was like, why do you have a torn hamstring? What's going on in other areas of your body that's contributing towards having a torn hamstring? It's been very slow work at times, very frustrating, but I had no idea until it just, a light bulb switched my, you know, for, for me that actually I was doing complementary work to what Irene was teaching at the same time, mm, spending more time understanding that. what was going on with my body. And so then this is the third conversation. The reason I want to speak to you, Kate, and you've spoken to Irene many times, and it's actually Irene who suggested that we speak, suggested to me that we speak when I explain the idea of this, of this podcast series is that you've also been doing this work and um, I wanted to have a conversation with someone that a, a peer type conversation. Hey, these are my experiences. What have yeah. been your experiences? Um, so there you go. That's the introduction out of the way. So <laughs> we can continue. So I love it. what I was going to say was since doing the nervous system work, um, have you have you noticed any changes in in your relationship? And actually, I'll just give that some context. I listened to a bunch of your podcasts and you did this wonderful uh, speech, and I can't remember the event that you were at, about the about uh, relationships and mm -hmm. connection and disconnection. And, and I'm sure that'll explain or unfold as we talk. Um, and it just gave me the idea, because as I was saying to you, I, I love these micro and macro, uh, micro and macro relationships where they're long term friends or or someone that's you know making your coffee in the in the coffee shop. And, and so I suggest to you, hey, why don't we have this conversation about the nervous system and about our experiences, but also within the context of, of relationships. So now all the housekeeping's done, I can say to you, in the nervous system work, as you've been doing the nervous system work, have you seen a, an evolution or a change in your relationships? And, and I suppose relationships, that could be in the context of, I was thinking about this earlier on, it could be in the context with other people, obviously with oneself, even with things like money um you know with nature I came to realize that actually everything external to us we're in relationship with um and so yeah i'm I'm, I'm curious to, to know like have ha, have you seen a change or have you seen a change you know what's been noticeable or you, you know so on and so forth yes and i think 
you know, I, one of the things that has driven all the work that I have done throughout my career, but also in my life is a desire to find a deeper level of connection. And I think that connection is what we're talking about when we talk about relationships. And I think that one of the things I've gained in, in doing some of this work, and you, you catch me at a funny time with this work. And I'll, I'll, I'll say that at the outset that I'm kind of, I'm in a I'm in a lull and I'm in an ebb and my nervous system has had a very hard year. And so I'm very reflective about my nervous system right now because I'm finding myself back in some old spaces, but in a new way and, and just sort of navigating what is never a linear path in right. nervous system healing work, um, which is something I, I like to remind myself and remind others that this, this isn't always linear. Uh, and in fact, very few things in life are. And yeah. one thing I've, that I've noticed, though, is that I really begin to feel the relationships that are happening both within me and without me and the spaces that I feel bridge between them. And one thing that I've been exploring a lot in my work, at least last year, I was really exploring it, was this difference between self and other, which I think is a lot of how we contextualize nervous system work, what is happening within the bounds of our skin and what is happening outside of it. But as I began exploring those relationships, I started to realize that the line between self and other is very blurry, very diaphanous, very hard to de define. And whether it's the idea that only one in 10 of the cells on and in your body is yours, the other nine out of 10 actually belong to your microbiome and members of the commensal bacteria and fungi and microorganisms that you share a quote unquote self with, which I think right there really begins to blur that boundary. And then everything that is going into our body through food is becoming us. And that was once a part of what we considered outside of us that is now inside of us. Yeah. And even the air we breathe, I'm looking around at all the plants in my room, right? And they're, they're off-gassing carbon, they're off-gassing oxygen that I'm taking in. And so that's, that's a part of their plant body. And I am breathing out carbon dioxide that they are taking in. And so even, even just within that small system is this reciprocal relationship and each breath is bringing new microorganisms that are in my environment whether that's dust particles or little bits of bacteria or fungi when i walk through the forest this changes tenfold right and that that changes my nervous system and they've shown that 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 presence just being in nature is going to change a lot of physiological features in your body but i think it's also changing things that we can't even give names to. And so in doing this work, one of the things I've noticed is that I am constantly in this ever flowing, ever cycling relationship with everything around me. Um, there's a there's a term holobiont, and it is the idea that you know it is self and all the layers of other that we are experiencing that we are superimposed with our microbiome and with the biome that we exist in, the ecosystem, the one billion microorganisms in a single teaspoon of soil. And I actually really appreciate this blurry line of self and other because so much of my nervous system has been about bringing that awareness into my own felt sense of my body like you talked about and, and what great timing. I just tore my glute medius. And so this has been a, a really interesting moment, right, of this interoception and, and feeling into what my body needs, but also maybe why, why, why did this happen? Why now? And what is it indicative of? Um, and, and sort of getting to find deeper connections in not just those big relationships, right? The relationships that we have with family, with lovers and partners and friends and self, but all the, also the, all of those micro relationships that are happening at this sub-perceptual level constantly. And I think it's really illuminated 
that for me. And that has brought me into a deeper awareness of myself because I think that we cannot understand self without triangulating it from being in space. And a lot of Irene's work is about that too, but that we understand this in reflection of what it is to share life with a plant, right? I can't experience beauty when I look out my window at this pasture out here. That experience of beauty is a reflection of other into me into self and so that right there is a relationship and so there is this constancy to relationship that I think this work has helped me recognize and relax into I think especially for those of us for whom we've had troubles with other humans in the past this triangulation of self through ecosystem can can feel like a different kind of being held if that if that makes sense yeah it's funny to even i appreciate some people won't find this funny but <laughs> it's funny to even think of ourselves as separate <laughs> to, to other yeah. things like yes. as if you just walk down the street and nothing's touching you or you know, perceptibly nothing's touching you and i'm on my own and i'm you know lonely and and i don't really ever ever have that so it's very easy and blase for me to say that but um it's funny to even think about that, <laughs> that you're on your own and that you're not, We're not. Into, you're not connected to anything else. It's just, it's just never, ever true. Um, and I suppose part of that is, is, is nervous system regulation to, to understand that in a, you know, to, to be able to have the presence to understand that, that you're never on your own. One of the things I found from doing, doing the work is just like an increasing level of sensitivity. And sometimes, uh, I really don't enjoy the increased level of sensitivity. <laughs> like, sometimes it's just overwhelming. Um, you yes. know, a, a tangible experience of that is just like, I, I never really kind of consider my, I'm, I can understand now looking back on my life that I was, I've always been quite hyper vigilant, and, <laughs> and to use a, a very current word, I think you could probably term parts of my life as quite anxious. And I never, ever would have said I was, I was anxious ever. Mm. I, I, it was always almost uh an advantage to be hyper vigilant because it meant I could get things done very quickly. Like I was the type of person, if I had a lot to do in my, on my to-do list, you could give me something else and I could still get it done. You know, it, it, I, like I used it to my advantage. And so in developing that mm. sensitivity and starting to realize like, I don't want another thing in my to-do list. The to-do list is already overwhelming. Oh my God, I'm collapsing that I feel really anxious about all the stuff that's got to be done. There's times where like, oh, I really wish I don't, I'll rephrase that oh, this is a sore game to be playing now that I've increased my anxiety. Oh, now I've increased my sensitivity. Now I'm realizing the times when I'm not being hypervigilant, I'm actually being anxious and I'm making decisions from that, mm. from that space. Like that's, that's kind of, I wouldn't say sore lesson. It's been an interesting lesson. And, and along with having that increased sensitivity, I've, I've uh, been able to develop the tools to be able to deal with that. So it's not like it's just come along and it's in isolation and all of a sudden I'm collapsing every, every day. Um, not at all, but um, yeah, it's it's been interesting as those relationships have developed. What has developed in the context of those relationships? I found myself as a result of being more more sensitive, being more empathetic. I would say I was always quite an empathetic person anyway. Now I can now I have even more context to understand that uh, to understand what other people's experiences are, like what they're going through in the moment, not necessarily hold it against them. Like, I, okay, I can kind of see that this is what's going on with you and I understand why you're having that response to me or the, that reaction to me at the moment. Doesn't mean that I don't then myself go into reaction, but yeah. I at least have the intellectual understanding of it. Um, even that, though, has I found challenging because I, because I understand perhaps a little bit better why someone's, uh, uh, you know, behaving the way that they are or they're having the reaction the way that they are. And I can be more empathetic. I can find myself becoming even, even uh, more flexible with my boundaries, <laughs> accepting things that are really not okay, but because I understand that this is what's going on with them. Like, oh, it's okay. Like I understand what's going on with them. Almost like wrestling, you know, like in a wrestling ring where you have the ropes and they just kind of bend forwards and backwards. And you feel like you're on a kind of roller coaster with these, trying to 
trying to find a place where they're a bit more stable and like, okay, I don't need them to go all the way over there and all the way back over here, just within these kind of boundaries. And, and it's okay for me to say, okay, that's enough. I appreciate that's the experience you're having. That's why you're re reacting this way, but that, that doesn't mean it's okay. You know, like I'm, I'm still involved in, in the relationship between us. I, I think that that's a really interesting paradoxical quality of recognizing that there really is no boundary of self and other. And yet, <laughs> <laughs> and yet there is a boundary that we need to be able to, to put up, to communicate both with ourselves and with others in order to protect our space as it were and and to and to have some of that individualism within a mutualistic realm and 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 I'll ask you this question because as you were talking I was thinking about this and I think that coming back to that sense of what you call sensitivity which I think for a lot of my nervous system work it's been learning how to accept and regulate that sensitivity that has been constant for me since since I was very young yeah um, and a constant sort of leaky boundary and absolutely hyper vigilance and I find myself a little bit back there now but one of the things that I think about is I think that we were meant that the human organism is something that's very sensitive and alert to its surroundings. And when we think about our evolutionary history, and even now I, I'm a walker, I walk usually two to three hours a day and oftentimes in the forest, I'm amazed at how sensitive my nervous system is to a shift in the wind, a shift in temperature, a shift in the noise level, how sensitive my vision is to just the slightest movement of a leaf or, or something in the tree canopy and just how sensitive I am. And, and my body was forged to be sensitive in that way, to, to hunt, gather, to alert, myself to the presence of others in a space. And I think that modern life has inundated us with sensation. There is a constant whirring and whizzing that is visual, that is auditory, that is just sensation, even just all the all the electronics around us, right? And And I think that in that, one of my questions is, have we sort of shut down because we're trying to tune some of that out because it is too much, because it is too overwhelming. And so when we come back into that sensitivity, there is this experience of overwhelm from a life that is incredibly different than what is very ancient hardware um, and software, honestly, in a, in a in a very modern setting that is very new when we consider it in the lens of deep time, very new to the human organism mm. to be inundated in this way. Yeah. My, so my opinion on that would be that uh, if you take the example of a funnel, you know, you have the wide end and the thin end. I would say like our natural state is actually the wide end. Um, but we, in order probably for survival, we, we <sighs> shut everything down to go to the thin end. So for me, <sighs> I've, I, I, I would say I've always been very empathetic. It's really interesting to look at my family, you know, to look at, say, my parents, and uh, I don't have children, my brother has children, and to notice the similarities between certain members of the family and what their experiences have been. And and just naturally what, what they're like as their personality and then what their experiences have been and and how that's that's altered them. For example, my, you know, like in my parents, my mum is the very sensitive one. Um, in my my brother and myself, I'm the very sensitive one. In my brother's kids, his son is the very sensitive one. And you can see these, like, it's really interesting to see these patterns, like what my mum does, what I do, what 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 uh, my nephew does. Um, but to go back to your point, so I would say that we are the open end of the funnel. And from my own experience, one of the reasons I'm ex I feel like I'm experiencing more empathy is, is I shut everything down. And that's that would have been modeled to me by by my dad. Um, just unable to cope with emotions so shut everything down and then as I've done more of this work I've kind of slowly can come out of the small end of the funnel and more into the open end of the funnel and almost at a rate that I can cope with and when it becomes too overwhelming I'm just going to shut down 
one of my um, characters has always been to in in the in contrast to loving to be with people i love to be on my own and i and it's somewhere in my psyche i always had that fancy of like i just want to go to a cave and be left on my own and what i began to understand that to be was like because the world's too much for me like and i can't cope with it and i need to just basically block off the world and just be on my own because that that's what feels okay to me like i can i can cope with myself but i can't cope with anyone else and that's probably even mostly to do i suppose with emotions when i think of previous relationships and i <laughs> almost feel like i need to let a, uh, write a letter of apology to previous girlfriends i just was unavailable in an emotional way not because i was trying to be unavailable but because i just didn't know like i, I like I, you don't know what you don't know and i just I didn't know that they didn't want me to fix things <laughs> or you know they wanted me to you know to or it would have been more beneficial for our relationship if i was able to feel things and articulate that i just it was just too overwhelming so i so i shut it down and, and i i would say that is kind of i would say that we have access to a lot of things but we don't really know how to deal with it and so we shut it down yes. and one example of that would be what comes to mind is um the aldous huxley book doors to perception um mm -hmm. he talks about um if anyone doesn't know he talks about um taking peyote and how he took peyote and it basically just opened the doors of perception like all of a sudden his five senses went to a to a to a thousand senses or and i'm just putting that number out of the the, yeah. the bucket having had experiences with hallucinogenics some of which i it's not that i regret it but i did it very naively like i can attest to that experience where all of a sudden there was such an overwhelm of uh, of experiences going on and and no guide <laughs> to, to take me through that experience or or no reference for it like it it can be overwhelming I, I i suppose one could say that the the context of a bad trip so to speak is just being so overwhelmed by what it is you're experiencing because you have no um ability to control that experience that it that it goes that you go into shut down and you know that or, or into panic or so on and so forth and that's then you just go <laughs> ride the lightning so to speak um you know to get out of the other end um so i yeah i would say that i would say that human beings have a natural state of being very sensitive but i want uh, there's a couple of couple of couple of levels to that i would say we have a natural state of being very sensitive but as we're born, it's probably shut down to, to cope with this world. Um, yeah, that, that probably summarizes it. I, I think we probably are naturally very sensitive beings, but we shut down, but we shut it down. And then there's probably things which, or well, not probably, there are things which happen in our life which shut us down, which which we know because, or we know of because that's some of the essence of the nervous system work, the experiences that, that happen in childhood or, or happen in adulthood or, or chronic stress. You can't, you know, if, if you're, you know, having if there's a line in the, the classic, if there's a line twenty yards away from you, you're not thinking about the text that you need to to send to to someone else, or you know, to your girlfriend to explain why you're late for the meeting, right? You're you're, yeah. you're used dealing yeah. with that. So, so yeah, I would say that that we are not all naturally sensitive, and depending on the life that you're experiencing, it's probably being shut down in some way. And then I, I don't know. I just feel like I, I guess I'm trying to avoid a a spiritual sense in the conversation because it can be quite ambiguous i would just say that there's there's other reasons why we shut down i couldn't even articulate what those reasons are but you know part of being becoming more sensitive is you start to have more experiences unexplainable experiences like uh, i've heard yeah. that i've heard that a million times from different people as they've sat down to go through their meditation journey they've become they've started to have experiences that could not be explained in, in, in the everyday world or so on and so forth. As they've become less yeah. hypervigilant and therefore more, more sensitive, they've started to experience things that they never would have before. And I, that's also my experience. Um, I love, I love the use of the idea of the funnel though, as you were talking, I couldn't help but think about it too, like aperture, right? You're a photographer. Yeah, right. yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and, I don't know why so... I didn't choose that example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I do think that there is also some dilation and contraction that happens. Again, we're we're trying to to widen that, but at times it does contract during times of high stress, and it's also referred to as a window of tolerance in certain spaces, right? That you have 
a sort of amount that that window of tolerance is open and, yeah. and sometimes that window only opens this much and sometimes it opens really wide and sometimes it's just a bit of a crack and and sort of that space is is where we can exist without going into a sort of hyper or hypo state and that certainly connects with me over the years that times when I'm outside of that window of tolerance um, and and shutting down in one way or another, like whether that looks like a, a freeze or a, a sort of more hyperactive, anxious state, um, though I am by nature a bit of a freezer. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I. Um, yeah, it's just it's, it's just really interesting to think of of that of like. I think there's times where it's important to, to uh, I'm going to say freeze, but in order to cope with yeah. life, like, like yeah. you know, but the thing that comes to mind is, you know, you, you talked right at the beginning of like, think, you know, this path isn't linear and it's not because no. sometimes you feel great and you feel open, you're really sensitive and you, and you have the space to do that. And other times it's like, okay, it's just really necessary that I shut this down. Like, because yes. it's, it's the only way that I'm going to get through this experience. And that, and that I guess is a sign of a fully functioning nervous system that you can, go from top to bottom or bottom to top at, you know, yeah, when, when, is when is, when is required, but then you have the skills to be able to take yourself back from the top or back from the bottom. Um, I revisited something uh, this week. I'm in a bit of a freeze right now. So, you know, like I said, this, this, this podcast is kind of coming for me at a little bit of a funny time and I'm a bit of a freeze and, Right before winter last year, I also found myself in a bit of a freeze and I wrote this piece. And as I was kind of going into this freeze, I was really coming into winter where I am in this ecosystem. And I started noticing all of the different ways of freezing that existed around me. And so I started noticing that on my walks, if you've ever, have you ever seen ice needles? And uh, so icicles, ice needles. And right. so ice needles are when you have a bunch of moisture inside the soil. And when you have rapid freezing temperatures, um, in ground that was at least slightly thawed during the day, yeah. you'll get the growth of these ice needles, these wow, sort of spindly needles of ice that will literally push rocks up out of the soil. Like they will hold rocks. And if they're frozen enough, they'll even hold your weight. Um, you can kind of almost walk on them and you can feel this. And there's a whole field of them and I had some pictures of them. But there's also there's also icicles, these incredible stalactites of water that are created by this constant dripping. But there's also, and especially in the area of the country that I'm in, if you're familiar with frost heaves, it's when you bury, for example, a fence pole in the ground, and over time, the frost and the ground freezing and thawing is so powerful, it will push a pole that is buried six feet deep up from wow. the ground. And so you have these frost heaves. And when we think about glaciers, right, the movement of glaciers throughout a landscape, they're doing is kind of scarifying the land and bringing with them all of this sediment. And when they leave, they leave very fertile valleys. Um, you know, you were just out, you were just out West looking at Buffalo and know where you were, mm, but Jackson. you know, Jackson. So th that is a great example of that Yellowstone Valley and around Jackson is, you know, the movement of a glacier that left a lot of fertility in that area. And so one thing I've been thinking about is, I think it's really easy for those of us that experience freeze and, and any nervous system state that is kind of viewed in a negative light at times and in various different media spaces to really internalize that negative view. And one of the things I've been asking myself, because we use when we use metaphor and literary relational devices, so often they are couched within the language of nature. And freeze is something we find in nature. But what I see when I look at freeze is incredible strength and yeah. incredible transformation, right? I mean, it is the phase shift of water 
from a, a liquid to a solid and an incredible one that is essential to life on earth. Even if you just look at the way that, that, uh, glaciers and ice flows work and the freeze creates a, a material that floats on water and is able to insulate right yeah. and you see this strength in the ice needles and the frost heaves and you see this fertility that's left in the wake of glaciers and i think that through that lens i began to connect to a freeze response in a different way that i can begin to see that there is something here that is happening, that freezing is always defined as a lack of movement, but in many ways it's anything but. It is this transformation and it is leaving space for something I think more fertile afterwards. And so one of the things I think this work has allowed me to do too is to sit and be with some of these states that come up, even if they're some of the more quote unquote undesirable ones. Mm. And to see a reflection of that in other spaces of of how it could be, how I could look at it through a different lens. When and you, sorry, go on. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was gonna say, so when you um when you're experiencing freeze and so as we're saying that it's not linear. Sometimes one is in freeze or one is in flight or one is in, you know, so on and so forth. Do you, do you rec, are you able to recognize it because you are having a, a similar set of characteristics are coming up? Um, are you, when those come up, how does that, how does that work? Does it, are you aware that you're going into freeze? Yeah. Is it, is it, well, I was going to say, is it a linear process? Are you aware you're going to freeze? Then you're like, okay, cool. I've got these tools. This is how I'm going to take myself out of freeze. Or is it a case of, um, oh my God, I'm in freeze. I've been in freeze for so many, so, so much, you know, so much time or however long. Yeah. And then it's just about having grace for, for yourself as you kind of naturally take yourself out of freeze. I've always been a believer in that, um, you know, perpetual motion, right? When, when one is in an experience, it's mm -hmm. very easy to be like, oh my God, I'm never going to get out of the experience. It's that bad trip feeling. Yeah. Being the Italian oh my God. I'm never going to leave this trip. I'm gonna, it's going to be like this forever. <laughs> yes. Yes. I definitely have had that. But being the eternal optimist in that moment, I'm like, okay, that's another minute gone. That means I'm a minute closer to the end or a minute closer mm. to the end, or a minute closer to the end. Like, like, you know, yes, one is in freeze, but actually in a, with a microscopic lens, there is, there is some movement. So what I'm really asking is, yeah. Do you see when you have these experiences, do you see yourself going into it and you're, and then you proactively use the tools or use your experience to pull you out? Or is it like, I'm in this and now I'm out of it, but my reaction to it is completely different now that I have an understanding of it or I'm familiar mm. with this? What a great question. I think that it depends some that there are different circumstances. I often now, as I have done a lot of this work, as I have gotten older and just experienced this more, feel that I have a recognition of, if not exactly when it's happening, shortly after it has happened, uh, one or the other. And I, I think I've had both. And I think that there are a set of defining characteristics for me where I can begin to identify that this is something that is going on. Curiously enough, since we're talking so much about relationships, one of mine is my ability to really communicate with other people that begins to shut down. And I begin to go into that space where I feel that I want to go into a cave and be more isolated, to be more alone. And that is one of those tells for me as yeah. it as it were um but it is also how i am able to relate to my internal sense of my body that it is a sense of dissociation of overwhelm at sensation both within my body and without my body that everything feels intense and i just want to again like close that aperture go down into that more narrow space of the funnel in order to protect myself because everything feels like too much and like it is bearing down on me. But I think that one of the things I've noticed in doing nervous system work is I think about it almost like a spiral, right? That we're, we, we find ourselves in almost the same space, just like a spiral. You know, if you were to draw a line from the center of the spiral out, like you were drawing a radius on a circle, 
it feels like the same space, right? It's it's sort mm-hmm. of that that same place, but you've changed a little bit. Yeah. And 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 suddenly there are these shifts and you're beginning to build better roadmaps out of that space. And so then the question becomes, okay, here I am. I found myself in freeze. This is familiar. I've been here before. I've done a lot of work to to prevent this from happening, but also to recognize it when it comes. And then how can I begin to build some some steps to get out of this space a little bit faster or with a little bit more grace and acceptance for myself? And this is something that I've toyed with too, because I think we bandy about the word healing in this idea of... <laughs> returning to some original state yeah. that we can't even remember. And I've started to reconsider that healing is an integration and transformation. I will never be who I was. My nerv- nervous system will never be what it might have been if X, Y, and Z hadn't happened, if I hadn't had these experiences in childhood. And so now it's about that transformation and that integration and acceptance while still finding that, that movement, right. That, that movement and that shift. And some of that has given me, and you mentioned a great word, which is a sort of grace for myself when I'm, when I'm in these spaces and to recognize the confluence of factors that have got me into it. And, and I think again, you know, like when I go out and I walk in the woods at the other day, I I stopped next to a river and I looked at a little eddy, right. This little, this little water swirling, you know, and it, an eddy is a place where water has sort of gotten stuck in this sort of ruminative pattern, but it, it's going to come out. There's going to be some sort of force that, that draws it back out and into the stream again. And I think that this is a very natural experience. And, and I, I do, I see it reflected to me back in nature. And I, I find that very comforting. Yeah. I was trying to think of my experience and um, I probably tend to get too overwhelmed. Oh, I, 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 so you know, being hypervigilant, mm-hmm. I, I would start to, I would start to take on too much and it'll overwhelm me. And then hence why I want to go to the cave uh, just mm-hmm. to kind of sh- shut everything off to be kind of left alone and and um, never bothered again. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think I probably, I think I probably move through the process quite quickly like it doesn't tend to extend over long periods of time for me. It doesn't extend over weeks or months. Like, it, mm. like it's, it, it's almost like a sharp jab to the face. <laughs> um, you know, it happens almost like in a day or a, probably even just on a day basis or, and I'm, I may keep the echo in there, but it, mm. I guess maybe, maybe that's the, maybe that's the case of just being, you know, like having a functional hypervigilant state that I'm able just to kind of continue every day as opposed to like I'm like oh it's just happens to me on a day basis then the next day I'm fine maybe it's it's more kind of functional um but I I definitely I suppose I definitely go into a shutdown by becoming so overwhelmed I just need to be left alone what I find challenging is other people not understanding that I need to be left alone and um whether that's um you know an expression of we need you to do this work or i need to have this conversation or can you do this it's just like i just need to be left alone and and going back to that going back uh you know a short while ago where understanding other people's states that's what's kind of been nice is understanding what they're going through and, and actually what what the appropriate response from me would be which is not to kind of meet you know tsunami wave with tsunami wave but actually just to and not to not to just kind of fall over and let it wash over me but maybe just to kind of step out of the way and let them let someone else have their experience and know that they'll come back tomorrow or you know a couple days later and but when I'm in that experience and I'm the tsunami wave that needs someone to step out of the way it doesn't it's challenging when that doesn't always happen right and then I guess that's what perpetuates problems in that you know someone is in a rage and there's ways to express that rage in a safe way and ways to express that rage in a wrong way. And if you 
have that rage and you go up against someone else that's unwilling to be unwilling to take you know take a step out of the out of the way for whatever reason then then that's when it can go wrong um in in whatever form that may be um yeah yeah i mean there 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 are nervous systems meeting in these venn diagrams of <laughs> of energetic components and and the way that we rebound and come in and out of one another and and to recognize that and to make space for both yourself and another i think is a a skill of a widening aperture as it were yeah it makes me makes me think of kids um makes me think of kids who are kind of going you know maybe having a tantrum and what it gets met by is a tantrum by the parent and then that the inevitable there's only one person that wins in that scenario you know is the parent uh you know in, in the longer term and uh how that just kind of sends it sends that child into shutdown uh, and not to 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 throw blame at anyone but just that experience of wow i mean obviously again not having children i don't have to go through that experience or i'm not going through that experience but um yeah the impact that that has in that moment i think it's really interesting it, you know i I don't have children either, but I had that experience as a child that all of my big reactions were met by a very big reaction. Yeah. Uh, and and having to navigate that set a lot of my relational patterns. And I think that a lot of this is working through some of the originations of these these early childhood patterns and the ways in which we come to a space of reparenting ourselves and and meeting ourselves in a different way because i think that those those early you know to bring this back to relationship those early relationships really do set something up and mm -hmm. and in in a fascinating way and i do think that there's there are some things that are innate about about who we are and then some things that are forged in the fire over time and this is something that i've also gotten to see reflected back to me actually in the animal husbandry and and sort of shepherding is to watch patterns emerge amongst family groups of even goats i know that that might sound a little silly but no yeah, I, I can this, actually see it i wanted to ask you this question actually so uh, for the listener the context is that that you're a butcher and a regenerative farmer and i i really wanted to ask the question of and and so also i you know i've been as we've talked about i've been making films about regenerative farmers and what what interested me um but obviously not by coincidence, I suppose, not that I'd noticed it, was I've been making these films with regards to the relationships that the farmers have with their animals. That that That's what really intrigued me. Mm. I had never really thought about relationships between farmers and animals other than being purely functional. And and yeah. then being in these farms, I started to notice that, that, yes, these were functional relationships. There was no getting away from that. But there was so much more depth to it. The the dairy farm that I made a film about, she had a herd of 300 300 cows they all had nicknames she's like that one's badger because she found her ba down a badger hole that one's queenie that one's mm -hmm. you know there was a little story attached to them and so so it was really intriguing to me you know to to, to see those relationships i previously unknown existed so my the question or the topic i wanted to talk to you about was what, what do you what do you, you how has your relationship changed with the animals or 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 what is your relationship to the animals and then yeah how do you see I don't know whether you would say the nervous system work in the context of the animals, but just the observations that you make, um, the the interplay, I suppose. There's the there's the wonderful film I'm sure you've seen that my my biggest little farm, and in it the farmers go through all these different problems with all the different animals, and then eventually you know they have this animal which eats this animal, which means this happens to this animal, which means that happens to this animal. It's like you can see that once you take one animal out, it screws the entire system. But they're all in this, to your point earlier on, they're all interconnected. Like each of them has a relationship that has a counter relationship that means that this relationship functions properly, properly once left alone, you know, and obviously, you know, our tendency is not, not to really leave nature alone. Um, so that's a really long winded way of saying, I would love to hear some more about your experiences on the farm yeah. with the animals and the relationships. 
there's a lot of layers there because there's the layers of my relationships with the animals, the relationships between animals themselves, and then the relationships between animals within an ecosystem. And is kind of is kind of how I see that. I'm going to start yeah. with my relationship to the animals, um, just because I think it's an easy starting place. And one little disclaimer that I want to put at the front of this is that I'm very aware of our human propensity to anthropomorphize everything and to impose human culture on animal culture that I think we scarcely understand. That being said, I think that one of the biggest gifts for me in having these relationships with animals is getting to witness that culture. And so while I might anthropomorphize it some, one of the things I want to highlight is just how rich their inner experience is as I witness it. Now, you know, whether or not I'm, I'm putting something on it, maybe, but I also think that our culture is so anthropocentric. We are so human centric. We are so hierarchical um, in the way that we place ourselves sort of above and different from other beings. And my experience in animal husbandry has been that we are an interconnected web and that there isn't that same hierarchy and that there is rich culture in a hive of bees or a herd of goats that we can't understand. Um, maybe we could someday, but I think it's really rich. So I do want to put that little disclaimer on it. Um, the relationship that I have with the animals, and I think that we all have with domesticated species. So I'm raising domesticated goats and cattle. We have a couple of horses and, and some poultry here on the farm. And I do want to make this distinction, because I think when we talk about domestication, there's a great book called Defending Beef by Nicolette Nyman, which is an environmental lawyer and uh, has to run a ranch with her husband, Bill, for a very long time. And she talks about this sort of contract that we have with domesticated species, that there's this reciprocity, this ancient contract, right? This this contract that's, you know, depends on the animal, but let's call it with with dogs. And I think we can argue about who domesticated who in, in that situation. <laughs> And in many situations, it's, you know, between 30 and 50,000 years old when we're talking about more typical livestock like poultry or cattle, we're talking about something that's usually between one and 6,000 years old, right? But I think that that contract is of reciprocity. It is an agreement that we will care for, that we will house and feed and ensure the welfare and well-being of these animals in return for the many gifts that they give us, meat, milk, fiber, and companionship also. And, and I, I don't want to discount that piece either. And so as I move through my relationship with these domestic animals, which again, I have a very different reciprocity with than I do with, for example, the wild deer, there is reciprocity there, but I think it is a very different kind and different relationship is really special. And I think it's special because there is a flow of intimacy cross species that is really stunning. And recently I interviewed a woman named Melanie Challenger, and she said that she thinks that one of the superpowers of Homo sapiens in particular is our ability to have very generative, affiliative love that crosses species boundaries, mm, that our, our love for our dogs, our cats, a pig, a goat, a skink, uh, you know, and can be really big, can can look like the relationships that we have with brothers, with mothers, with lovers. And I don't, I just mean in, in terms of anyway. Um, and I think that that is really incredible. And so one of the things that I've gotten to experience in terms of relationship is a sort of cross flow of, of being able to regulate one another's nervous system. So one of my favorite examples of this is, I have some milk goats. I don't sell milk, but it's for me. And Tenny last year was the only goat that I was milking. And she's she's the queen goat. So she's the the female head of the herd. She's she's the alpha and and things kind of flow from her and she makes a lot of decisions for the herd. 
And I was milking her and you have these moments where you're laying your head kind of on the flank of an animal and you're milking them. And this is a traditionally a mother-child bond where you have a a bi-directional flow of oxytocin um, that as milk flows oxytocin flows for the mother it flows for the child in a sense of connection this is true for humans as much as it's true for goats and I think any any lactating mammal but I really believe there's a flow between the two of us as I milk her and she she lost her kid and and that's how I ended up um, milking her last year is she didn't she didn't have a kid and you can feel I can feel my own oxytocin flowing and a sense of grounded comfort and almost meditative action in that milking and whether or not it's the grain that I bribe her with or the relationship that we have it feels like she also experiences that and has a very specific relationship to me also when I'm eating those milk products and anybody who eats her milk products she does it's like she can smell herself on you in a different wow. way and has this response to people who drink her milk or eat her yogurt that she doesn't have with people who don't. And, and so there is this, again, this self becoming other, right? That Tenny's milk becomes a part of right. me, that those microbes from my hands become a part of her microbes on her teeth, on her fur become a part of me. There's just this sort, sort of blending of self and other and this reciprocity um, that, that, is stunning that it it just it never ceases to amaze me that we can share such intimacy across this perceived species boundary um and and really get to experience one another in a different way and that sense of care um and i think that that is a big part of this is witnessing that i am responsible for these animals, for their well-being, for their welfare, but also for their joy, for them having a rich life, life and to, to care for them. And in turn, I get to witness the incredible relationship that they have with the landscape, with the ecosystem, uh, that I think is modeling for me, again, a relationship that I might have with an ecosystem. And so they're taking in plant matter that is becoming their bodies in the same way that the Tinnies milk becomes a part of my body. And that plant matter is built from all of the microbes and minerals in the soil that are, you know, rocks kind of weathered by deep time is how I think about it. And their, their waste products, right? Their urine and manure go back into feeding that landscape, feeding that soil. But I also notice that, especially right now, we're getting these pops of warm, sunny days, right? And I'll notice that all the animals on a warm, sunny day will stop eating just to lay in the sun and soak it in and chew their cud. And when they do this, they sort of melt into the landscape. There is that experience of oneness that I think a lot of people seek from sort of guided psychedelic experiences and, and different things. And what I read it as is, is this, they do, they just kind of melt into the environment. They get this sort of thousand yard stare, uh, their breathing slows down and they just seem to become one in that space. There's not that concentrated thought, that seat of self any longer. And they are incredible individuals. This is something I talk about a lot. They all have very different little quirks of personality, uh, even within the scope that we might see in a in a band of human people, you know, these little outliers and people that kind of fit underneath a bell curve and different roles within the herd that they're fulfilling, but they do just kind of disappear and melt into their environment. And I've learned a lot about that relationship from them, that sort of meditative aspect of being on a walk and just letting yourself be and not be ruminating not be <laughs> yeah. thinking but to just be a part of something um and then they have like i said they have these really incredible relationships with 
one another and getting to witness generations to see great grandmothers and grandmothers and mothers and daughters and to see how parenting flows even through even through goats and some surprising things too so I'll give I'll give one example and um I I also want to be conscious of your time oh no no I'm good talking a lot okay no 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 go go, go for it okay cool cool because I'm fine for however long but um a really interesting, so I had this sweet goat, uh, and this doesn't have a very happy ending, but I had this sweet goat named Beastie. And one of the things that I've noticed is that with mothers that reject their kids, which is pretty, pretty common within, you know, nature and domesticity, that question I always ask myself is, does this mother have enough resources? Can I give her more resources? Mm-hmm. And I've actually never had a mother not keep her kids after rejecting a kid and coming back with that question, you know, is she low on the totem pole and isn't getting enough food? Is she, you know, is she getting picked on a lot within the herd? Is there a different place that I could keep her, you know, and I've never had a mother not come back and, and accept her next kids when I've asked myself that question but Beastie was a bottle baby and so her mother didn't take her and and I bottle fed her and she you really connect with bottle babies um, because again you have this sort of oxytocin loop that I think is is pretty natural and I do think it crosses a species boundary and so again you're holding a bottle they're getting oxytocin because they're getting milk you're getting oxytocin because it's the cutest thing you've ever seen and <laughs> and there's this little loop between you but in general you think that with kids that weren't mothered, you know, some of those mothering patterns get set and I'll see, I'll see the people mother in similar ways. And Beastie was the first kid I fed that then became a mother. And I wondered both because she had gotten pregnant when she shouldn't have and was a little bit young and because her mother rejected her, how she would respond with her kid. And when she had Mike D. So Beastie and she had a boy, Beastie's a boy. So his name was Mike D. Um, (laughs) Really ridiculous names over here, but she, not only was she one of the most devoted goat mothers I had ever seen, but she also showed me Mike D and he had less of a fear of me as a human than these sort of intrinsic fears that other goat kids have because I think she related to me as being a sort of parent type figure and and that was then inherited inherited by her son and so you see just these fascinating patterns emerge of of more attachment style parenting and and more avoidant style parenting even within the context of these animals and how that fits together i have a i have a goat named Josie and she is just the most doting mother i she just she just dotes on her kids and she will babysit other kids and the mothers will go off and do other things uh, and, and she's the only mother that I've had that's ever, ever done that. She just, and she wow. inspires a fierce loyalty in her kids where, I mean, they all still sleep in a pod with her years later, you know, the kids that I still have that are Josie's like they just, you can see their respect for her and, and their continued sort of grounded attachment to her. And, and so I get to, to witness some of some of these beautiful and sometimes complex and and painful patterns happen in this domesticated species again with that disclaimer that there is some anthropomorphizing going on i can't i can't do it in a vacuum um, i've heard many farmers regenerative farmers describe regenerative farming as observing nature and then farming in connection with nature hmm. and um it, it's also popular at the moment uh, to talk about human beings having to you know connect with nature or reconnect with nature which would imply that they're disconnected from nature mm-hmm. which I, which is quite an interesting you know in the context of this conversation and just in the context generally it's quite interesting to 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 think that we think we're disconnected from nature and that we need to you know reconnect to nature or we need to encourage people to reconnect to nature or that people even do need to be encouraged to you know have a more um 
conscious relationship with nature. Mm-hmm. I was I was thinking about relationships. Obviously, I'm not a relationship coach, but I was thinking about relationships in terms of like what you know what makes a good relationship. Um, and my list won't be exhaustive, <laughs> but no, you know, like having a, having a conscious relationship and and listening to each other, um, wanting to spend time with each other, you know, just these these you know just just those three three characters there you know wanting to spend time with your partner in this in this context relationship wanting to spend time in the woods or or on the hills or in the mountains um versus spending time in the office um you know listening to what nature has to say to you so as you're walking through that forest listening to what it's got to say to you whether that's you know through through the animal calls or the or the leaves rustling or even just observing it as a different context of listening to it i think it's just an interesting rabbit hole to go down in one's mind like what you know what 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 is what do we perceive to be good relationships and how does that apply to to all these different different areas nature being one of them um yeah. really interesting to you know and of course animals aren't even thinking well presumably <laughs> animals aren't thinking like that like they you know it's 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 you know they're, they're well they have a more intuitive sense of they do yeah they do they do and i think that i think that that actually speaks to something too that intuitive sense is something that has not been broken and i think that sometimes our intuition is broken by some of the and by broken i don't mean that it can't be healed or that it can't come back together that it's irreparable but it is fractured it is it is uh, distended shifts because of the way that we're raised in society. And I, I mean, I think you see this, that, you know, goats don't read parenting books. They don't read birthing books. They don't read diet books. And yet they're able to do all of these things rather with quite a bit of a plum. And one thing that I'll say is I know that there is this big movement around being an observer of nature, but it's a great quote. I think it's Werner Heisenberg, and I can probably find it for you, um, who founded the uncertainty principle in physics. Um, but he came back and he said, we have this idea of being the observer, but the truth is that we are a participator. There is wow. no observation that we have to, you know, and he was talking about observing something in a scientific way, we have to break the glass and yeah. and participate. We are tied into this thing and our participation, whether we recognize it or not, whether we recognize that we are a part of nature consciously or not, we are. Yeah. And we are participating, whether it is with active conscious thought or not, just by nature of being here we are too interwoven into that fabric to to not participate and I often think about this you know the the byline of the podcast is threads of what it means to be humans woven into this earth because when you tease at a single thread and a weaving it's tugging at everything else even in just the the slightest way and I really do believe that's true as the fabric of a human species as the fabric of an ecosystem and we are part of all of those things and have cause and effect even if we're not conscious of it yeah it makes me think about so i'm wondering um about you know so relating this back to the nervous system and being regulated and and uh dysregulated or or being connected or disconnected and um you know i lived in london for 20 years and uh, i moved back out i moved back i grew up in the countryside moved to london for 20 years and, and moved back out. where do you live now i live about an hour north of i, I live in a, a county called cambridgeshire which is about an okay. hour north of london and it's the flattest part of the country so this mm. all, all i'm you from have the is, flat part of the country too so i okay. like that we so you just have these great big skies and horizons that go on forever and uh, you know yeah. I, I live a few minutes walk from country country trails and these types of things and I, you know my experience now with london is that it's really thrilling for me to go back in and i really miss it um but when i'm there I'm like, oh my god I, you know i need the balance of being back out and, and kind of uh, and you know going for my runs in in the forest or on the country roads or um i remember during during covid i had a conversation with a friend of mine who's in london and, and in the uk there was one of the rules was that you you could only go out for an hour a day 
And uh, I remember having a conversation with my friend in London and he's like, what, what have you been up to today? I was like, oh, I've been out, you know, for a couple of hours. And he was really upset that I've been out for a couple of hours and until I explained, he was like, I've literally seen five people and I've been out, you know, for five hours and, they, and they're like 600 yards away on the horizon. It's just not the, the same level of, you know. Uh, Density. Say, yeah, exactly. And so my point being is like being in London, it's like you just, just in, you know, walk down very busy streets, I get on subways, I go into offices, I go into shops. I'm overwhelmed with people, even though I wouldn't use the word overwhelmed, mm-hmm. like because it doesn't overwhelm me because I've had so much time there to build that capacity, right? I come walking down the street, I can walk 400 yards and probably pass by 20,000 people. It's, it, it, in some ways, you have to be completely disconnected to that experience in order to have that experience. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, what comes to mind is people that that have that experience and then they go on a two week holiday and they say, well, it takes me three days to wind down, to get into the holiday and three days to, you know, at the end of the holiday winding back up. And it's like, yeah, that's you kind of kind of regulating back, you know, into the experience. Like you're having to reconnect because it, it's such a disconnecting experience to, you know, to operate in a, a quite an unnatural way. Like it's a, it's a man-made way, right? Yeah. It's, I, do you mind if I if I please com- please if yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. I think there's I've been thinking a lot about this sort of delineation between our relationship with the built world and our relationship with what I'm going to call the natural world. Now, again, the, any any boundary can get a little bit fuzzy. And I live I live about three and a half hours from New York City, and I go into the city not super often, but regularly enough. And I think it's so interesting because I can almost feel it, right? Just even driving or taking the train into the city as I enter a certain bubble, a certain radius, I can almost feel uh, an uptick in my nervous system. And it's it's a sort of excitement. It's a sort of yeah. uh, vibration that is yeah. felt and, and a sort of stimulation, it, a very stimulating effect, almost like a, almost like caffeine. Right. Just kind of coming up, coming on. And I think you're absolutely right that in order to hold the idea that you might you might cross 20,000 people on a, you know, two hour path around town, maybe more is absolutely wild and something that we have to begin to turn off. And I think that also one of the fascinating things is that we are we are surrounded by nature transformed in these places. It is unrecognizable. Mm. And so our the human numbers, the population density is unrecognizable to our to our nervous system, the sort of nervous yeah. system that was forged in an evolutionary landscape where, you know, oftentimes there weren't as many people in the world as there are in New York City or, <laughs> or London, much less New York is in your vicinity. <laughs> um but you're also surrounded by the transformed natural world, right? You have all of the sand in the form of glass and concrete. Yes. You have metal that's been pulled out of the earth and forged into steel. You have timber that's no longer in the form of trees, but is, you know, this sort of scaffolding for smaller buildings, clay that has been made into bricks, you know, that was once soil. And so you're in this completely built or transformed world that is very disconnected from its natural state yeah. still present uh it's present in different quantities and it's present in different uh, sort of presentations formats phases and i think that that response is to shut down and i think that what is interesting that as I forget the numbers. I think we're moving towards 50% of the world population living in urban environments. I think wow. that's correct. I can double check that and send it to you at the end of the podcast, but it's it's right around there. It's right around 4 billion people that live in urban environments. And I think that this is really interesting because at the same time, we have this crisis of loneliness and studies show that loneliness is, is more detrimental to your health than smoking. I think it's like half a pack of cigarettes a day. It has this incredible impact. And I've actually spent 
a lot of time alone this last year, which has been a part of some of my my struggles alone here on the farm in a very not population dense area. Um, but that, and I think that there are a lot of different reasons for this loneliness. It's not just our move to an urban environment. It's also the way that we conceive of family, that we conceive of our social structures and, and a lot of different things. But it is true that we find ourselves more surrounded by people and more alone than we have ever been. And I think a lot of that is that desire to shut down and disconnect this sort of built fabricated world in both a, a people way, but also in a structure and surroundings and environment way. And it it changes us. Yeah, yeah, radically so. I, I spent some time living in New York too. And uh, I, yeah, just I had an incredible time. It was the right time for me to be there. Now I just, now I don't think I can cope with it other than as I like sort of kind of day trips. I think one of the great things about London is it actually does a really great job at um, uh, with its parks. There's many parks throughout mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. all of London, mm -hmm. and you can you can be in some of them. Not it, you have no idea that you were even in London, like a, you know, mm. because they're so dense and um, and just so mm. well designed. Um, yeah. So 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 thinking then again about the nervous system, and and bringing that back to the nervous system. And how kind of cities do, I, I think it's interesting because it's like a bit like there's always a movement forwards. I feel like we're always kind of being regulated. But again, going back to that, our, our ability to tune into the being regulated. So what do I mean by that? So even in cities, it's like, you know, that you have, let me think about that. Yeah, take your time. I would say, well, from the context of our nervous systems, we're always doing what we need our nervous systems to do. Whether that is shutting down or whether that's being regulated, whatever the appropriate, whatever's going on is the appropriate response for for what what we know to be the appropriate response, as in what do we individually need at that moment, whether it's freeze or whether it's um, hypervigilance. In a way, I think you can you can say that even though that's not, it would be incorrect to term that as regulation. We're actually having the experience that we need that will eventually bring us into regulation. Like, like in a sense, like we're never doing anything wrong. Like it, like not, not, this isn't going, I've gone into freeze or I've gone into shutdown or I've gone into, you know, rage or whatever. It's, it's not wrong. It, it's not wrong. No. Like the experience you're having is, is not the wrong experience. It's just, it's just the experience you're having it and, that that end journey that that you're on i would say eventually goes to regulation yes so it's so it's in in the world that we live in where there's 10,001 things to do in the morning as a morning routine <laughs> in order to optimize our day and make it the most efficient and you know this this is the food you have to eat and this is what you have to do and yada 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 like that that is overwhelming and and to put mm -hmm. wanting to shut down and i think it's important to recognize that if you don't get to do any of those things that it's not, you know, it's not the negative. It's like, I, I just, again, the internal optimist in me wants to say that it's like, we're always kind of moving towards that state and our nervous system is going through the state that it needs to go in. Um, and eventually it comes out, you know, the other side. Does that make sense? Yes. Because I think that we're, our bodies want our bodies, our ecosystems, any biological system tends towards homeostasis. Right. And, and, whether or not we're in homeostasis, whether or not we're in this this perfect, uh, this perfect optimal uh, sort of window, our body is trying to get back to that space, and and anything that it's doing is adaptive, and I think that this is always a moment where we can sort of pull back with an injury. For example, you you talked about mm. a torn was it a hamstring? Um, yeah, yeah, just. Very <laughs> and I have this torn glute medius, right, which is a stabilizer muscle, which makes it really interesting, right? Our glute medius <laughs> is one of our biggest stabilizer muscles, and I've torn mine. Here I am feeling a little bit unstable, both metaphorically and and, <laughs> and, and physiologically. Uh, you know, but our, 
our, our bodies want to get back to that sp space. And so these things that happen with our nervous system, and I think that we see a lot in sort of modern day literature that it, it's wrong or bad or broken, but I don't think it's any of those things. I think it's beautiful and adaptive. And I can sit back and thank my body for the ways in which it has tried to protect me or, or my mind for the ways in which it has tried to protect me and to try to tend back towards homeostasis, given the set of, of, uh, <laughs> things, the set of circumstances that it has found itself in, uh, whether that's physical or emotional or any of those things. And I, and I think that that is a skill set of humans is just how adaptive we are, that we can live in, in massive cities full of glass and concrete and people and stimulation, and we can live out in the middle of nowhere and and we can live in incredibly cold climates and very warm climates and mm -hmm. so we are adaptive and these these mechanisms are adaptive there's nothing wrong with them it doesn't mean that we and i do think with that we're trending towards regulation in in a long-term view uh at least within the nervous system but yeah yeah it's, yeah. it's, in, it's interesting to, well, two things there. It's, it's interesting to reflect back on one's own journey. As, I, as I've gone, you know, so I was thinking earlier on, you know, prior to us getting on to this call, you know, what's been my experience in nervous system work? And, and um, one of the things has been to better understand my past decisions um, mm. and, and why, why I made those past decisions. And, um, you know, so, so in reflection of like, okay, cool. I understand, like, even though I really wish I hadn't done that, <laughs> I can understand why I did that. You know, um, um, and um, it was never from a. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously thinking of what I perceive to be negative experiences. Um, it was never from a, a place of malice. It, it it was always from a place of like trying to to be safe or 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 an underlying need that I had. It just it, it expressed itself in that way. When I talked about having grace for oneself, like oh, it's a bit painful to think of those some of those experiences. But again, because I now have that understanding, I can kind of reflect a bit. Of, with a bit of grace, you know, I could probably argue that I could do maybe an apology here or there to to a few of the people that might that my my uh, my path crossed, and maybe at some point that that happens. But it's been, yeah, to to, to have that experience of of just kind of reflecting and, and have that grace in understanding why my behaviour was the way that it was. Empathy too towards yourself yes, and towards yeah. past versions of yourself too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been interesting, I've, and I've forgotten my my the second point I was going to make, but <laughs> um... I think that this is this is really, and this is this has been a big part of my journey is finding a sense of forgiveness and empathy for the decisions that I have made that maybe haven't been so generative for other people within my life, right? That that affected other people in negative ways and affected me in negative ways too, right? Yeah. And, and to have forgiveness for that that person who is me. But also I, I do think that I think a lot about cycles, right? I think a lot about natural cycles, whether it's a water cycle or a nitrogen cycle or a biogenic methane cycle, carbon cycle, um, all of these different cycles that kind of are constantly flowing in and out of one another here on planet earth and, and sort of holding all of those together as a life cycle. And I think a lot about ways in which past versions of ourselves, especially as we we do work like this, that we are transformed so completely and there is a sort of death of self. I don't know if it's a, a sort of ego death. I'm sure Aldous Huxley would have some things to say about this, <laughs> but <laughs> these sort of ego deaths and 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 having a sense of I come I would come back to death a lot in my in my work, uh, whether that's as a farmer, or as a butcher, or somebody who who spends time in nature, you you end up seeing a lot of death, and how important that death and decay and transformation is. And I actually think that for yeah. me that that decay and transformation is very dependent on that idea of 
forgiveness and grace and, and letting go also. Uh, yeah. I found that experience actually in being able to regulate myself more and thus being able to be more present in my relationships, you know, whoever that relationship has been with or whoever that relationship has been with to, to pick one at, uh, at random. Um, and I, I won't give specific, well, being able to be more present in those relationships, how healing that is for that other person, whatever, you know, whether that's friends or families or, 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 or intimate relationships, you, you know, you talked about certainly my, my experience, you know, decisions I've had in the past have not been generative to other people. Now that I'm able to be more present, and understand why my behavior is the way it is and, and, and have more of an insight into that and be able to regulate myself more, be actually able to turn up to a relationship in, with more presence and allow that person to have their experience and just to not, not to do anything. I mean, it's remarkable, actually, not to do anything, not to try and suggest anything for them to do, not to fix it for them, not to do it for them, but just to kind of be there and let just watch them go through their process of like, I have a problem. It's overwhelming. Now, actually, I can begin to sit with it. Now I can find my solution. And all it needed was actually just a witness to them, you know, and just someone to kind of be there and be like, okay, it's cool. I'll, you know, I'll pick you up if you, you know, I won't do it for you, but I'll, I'll pick you up and, and, and help you out if you, if you need it. Or I'm here. If you need support, you can ask. There's, there's someone here for you. Like how restorative that's been for, mm. for, for various people at various, in various different relationships. You know, it's, 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 it's almost, um, I was going to say it's almost overwhelming in how incredible it has been, it's been to to experience that because I had no idea that it existed <laughs> and I had no idea that it didn't actually require me to do anything <laughs> like <laughs> it just required me to shut the fuck up and just be there <laughs> you know you know it's really funny one of the things I was going to tease out that you said earlier is you were speaking about morning routines and optimizing and efficiency yeah. and you know the 16 things we need to do in the morning to be the most optimal versions of ourselves and I've been noticing more and more this language of optimization and efficiency yeah. in everything that we do and I think that we have taken really detrimental modes of the ideas of human progress, uh, especially since the industrial revolution, where it has been about this idea of efficiency that is about simplicity, it is about the bottom line, it is about optimizing for performance, for output, that we can output the most, we can be the most productive, that we can make the most money, that we can you know, have all of this efficiency built in our lives that is really born out of the industrial revolution, which I think is actually pretty antithetical to what an ecosystem is. Yeah. That an ecosystem is something that is only as efficient as it is inefficient in many ways. And and somebody brought this up on the podcast the other day, the difference between a, a stream and a canal, that a canal, you know, sort of seems to be efficient, this sort of built yeah. thing that is very linear and direct, whereas a stream is this meandering space, you know, you have deeper parts and shallower parts that become a host for all of this different life. You can have wetlands, but it is not efficient in that like sort of industrial top-down productivity sort of way. And I think that this world view has become our view of ourselves and of our relationships, that our relationships might be something that we could fix or optimize or tweak or you know make all of these things to. But what you just said is that just the allowing another person to have an experience, to be in the present moment with someone as their experience unfolds, unbidden, uncontained, unstructured, unoptimized, uh, is perhaps the most beautiful and healing thing. And I think that this striving towards optimization and efficiency is not doing anything for our nervous systems, which I think are much more sprawling, meandering yeah. <laughs> streams than they are man-made canals. I, I, I don't know if that resonates, but. Yeah, and totally. What comes to mind is allowing something to be what it needs to be, allowing something the time it needs 
to have you know doing the nervous system work is like you just can't can't rush it <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's yeah. impossible and, and you know if you do then you kind of probably arguably dysregulate yourself even more and, and, and again like exactly. allowing you know those uh, allowing those relationships to be what they need to be rather than trying to force them into something else you know that's that seems to be when the when the problems occur so um, yeah, yeah, what does it totally mean resonates. to just let something flow? And and you know, like we've like we've spoken about through this, a stream is going to have little eddies, little places where it gets caught and the water stagnates for a, a minute. You know, it's going to have all of these ins and outs and ebbs and flows. And so even when we are in flow, again, it's not a it's not a linear experience and it's certainly not something that can be rushed and uh, if there's one thing my relationship, I think, especially with with animals, uh, with ecosystems has taught me, it's that things cannot be rushed. They take the time they take. You wouldn't even know how relevant that is to me. <laughs> oh, I love that. I I'm love it. I love that. <laughs> I've been a constant, Tell me more. I've just been a constant rush in my entire life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah and, that, and that's been one of my my you know definitely in this process that's been one of my central lessons to 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 be okay with and and and, and to learn and 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 to sit with and sometimes I'm totally able to do it and uh, other times I just again it's so overwhelming to me that I just like I, I can't I can't deal with it like I just have to to rush that process like almost like consciously rush that process because I know yeah. it's not what I should be doing, but I know it's just what I need to do in this moment. And yeah. uh, you know, that's annoying, but, but it's cool. <laughs> that's the way it goes. Um, you yeah. know, it's just the process. Yeah. And I think, I mean, gosh, I, I, I certainly have moments of, of, of wanting to rush the process. And I think also, <laughs> you know, we're given these, one of the things I love about nervous system work is that it is not, it is not a silver bullet, one pill, solution and i think that that is something that is constantly presented us to us in the modern world is that there is this sort of silver bullet fix it there is this yeah. one pill fix it which isn't it's never the case that doesn't yeah. that doesn't exist it's never that simple because we are complex because we live in complex environments we are complex systems and one of the things i love about nervous system work is that it it isn't a one size fits all silver bullet that it is deceivingly complex um and also simple and irene have, and i have kind of talked about that that paradox some um, but it is also sort of meandering and it must be done on its own time and it, it is done on our own body's time and i think again like when to go back like society has shaped our idea of even time and 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 just the clock itself, the invention of the clock itself is riddled with the idea of productivity, of efficiency, of labor, um, and and just the term o'clock means of the clock, and and uh, clock hours were were specifically sort of it was initially sort of monastic prayer times um, right. that that would ring out, but the sort of uh, upper classes found that it was a good way to mark labor hours as well and to therefore increase their productivity and so and so all of this is is even even time is a construct within that way and i think we're we're handed down the societal idea of time that is categorically at odds with our nervous system and and yeah. i think even just emails, right? And the the space of text messages, how quickly we're meant to be connecting, how constantly we're meant to be connecting is on a time scale that our nervous that is a mismatch for our nervous system, right? And yeah, yeah. What I see with the goats is I mean, time is 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 measured in sometimes it's measured in in time between hay bales when it's winter and you know and hay is delicious but sometimes it's just measured in moments in the sun it's measured in time spent together or the time of day when suddenly it's time to play on the log every evening in the summer the goats 
mock battle it out to see who's king of the log uh, every right? every amazing. time right around sunset and and it, it's it's like clockwork but it's not measured like clockwork it's it's just measured in a felt sense of things and so i think beginning to sometimes asking ourselves not how we disconnect from from modern life you know not to disconnect but to uncouple from some of these concepts that we're so inculcated in from such an early age to allow ourselves to unfold at a at a different time scale a time scale of a tree or of a flower or of a goat or of the moon whatever you want to think of it as so what you're saying is be like goats be like goats. That's that's actually always what I'm telling myself. I can't tell you. I, you're my 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 greatest teacher uh, in life are are goats, Amazing. and I'm I'm not much. I'm not one for astrology. I, it's not. I don't put a, just a gob of stock in it. But I am a Capricorn, so I am a sea goat, and uh, I, <laughs> I do feel a, a deep kinship with them as a as an yeah. animal. What a blessing to be able to observe them every day and have a relationship with them every day and. Uh... Uh, you know any, incredible. any animal i mean it's like you know anyone that's had yeah. a dog or a cat it's just like that's oh, what i was gonna it's say such, it's such an incredible just a dog. Experience. yeah it's incredible i was i i uh, last night so i have this this beautiful dog about five years old her name is goldberry and she's a livestock guardian dog but she's also a family dog and and she's the best dog i've ever had she doesn't she has a very solid sense of rules that I I don't feel like I gave her, but she knows, you know, she's never gotten into the trash and, <laughs> and should never jump up on a piece of furniture. And then she's very like, she's like a proper. And last night, all I wanted was for her to come up on the couch and cuddle with me, but she's, she's not a lot. She's never been allowed on furniture and it's just so embedded in her. And I, I had to force her up onto the couch. <laughs> Um, she's also not much of a cuddler, but I, I wanted her to come be with me. And, and it was just fascinating to watch her process, right? And to, to wonder at the marvel of this connection that I get to have with this other being. Yeah. Um, and, and to see the inner workings of her that are so much more complex than I think we give animals credit for. Yeah, I agree. Um, is there anything you think that we've missed that we should that we should talk about or can I feel like we've covered a great deal and it was so thoroughly enjoyable but I want to check to see if you think there's anything we've missed I don't I don't think so this has been a fun rollicking conversation I think I would ask you the same thing that I want to make sure that we we touched relationships and nervous system in the way that you wanted yeah, absolutely. I wanted to have just this kind of open conversation and kind of have it flowing around the topic of relationships and, uh, yeah, to share our experiences and yeah, like we kind of ticked all those boxes and yeah, it was yeah, great. Yeah. I feel great. I mean, this was a really, this is, I don't get to have a conversation like this very often. So I'm very appreciative awesome. of the container that you've made and, and the way that you, you, you held it and, and saw me. So. I well, thank you. That. I really appreciate the, uh, yeah, your time and, yeah, being able to connect in this way with like, <laughs> I keep talking to people, I'm nervous. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. I I think a lot about um, I don't know, doing this work, and I'm sure you experience this as a filmmaker, a photographer, where you have these interests that sort of take hold of you, and yeah, and within yeah. podcasting work, whether it's the nervous system or lately, I've been on a real jag about talking about beavers, you know, Amazing. and so you're you're in a group of people and you're just the person talking about nervous systems or yeah. talking about beavers and um, sand is my other pet project right now. And so okay. there I am like talking about sand to, to no end. And, um, and it's actually always interesting uh, to to capture people's responses, especially in those micro interactions that we were yeah. that we were talking about. I had a really interesting one around sand the other day, and I think it's always fun to kind of have factoids to throw at people and and yeah. kind of. I like it when people are like, "What are you talking about?" Because then sometimes <laughs> actually something emerges where, yeah, oh wow, and and you form a connection over it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Kate, thank you so much. I'll press stop record. It has been it. a pleasure. Thank you.